Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And the man across the table here, actually, in Nashville, which you probably all recognize from his picture from uh, being out on the internet, is Marshall Goldsmith. Good day to you, Marshall. How are you? Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Namaste to you as well. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. Um, I learned more about you in the earned life than I earned than I learned from the other books. So it was it was really good. And I'm going to let my listeners who don't know much about you just give you a brief little bio. Uh, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith's been recognized as one of the top ten business thinkers in the world and top rated executive coach at the Thinkers 50 ceremony in London since 2011. Seems like so long ago. Published in 2015, his book Triggers is Wall Street uh, is a Wall Street Journal and New York Times bestseller. He also is the author of the New York Times bestseller and number one uh, journal business book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, winner of the Harold Longman Award at the Best Business Book of the Year. Well, you know, it's it's really a pleasure to have you back on the show. And especially about your book, do you have the Earned Life book behind you? I do, right here. The Earned that's, Life. That's because I never got a copy yet, but I did get a PDF of it. So thank you. And we are going to be talking about the Earned Life. Um, and it's from regret to fulfillment. Um, and I think that many of the listeners have always have, have had regrets. But let me start this off, Marshall, because... I looked at this as kind of an introspective. I've been studying Buddhism now for ever and ever. I'm a self-realization devotee. All my listeners know that. Um, and I recognize the, uh, real, the kind of fine line in spirituality and coaching uh, that that's one does. And this book has been written, as I say, when you're reflecting on your personal life at an age in life, where I think we all do some introspection. I'll be 68 years old this July. I appreciate the story that you told in the introduction about Richard and his regrets in life, just this character, somebody you coached. You state that any decent advice book aims to help readers overcome a perennial challenge. All of your books had some perennial challenge in them. You were helping people to overcome. You state that the challenge you're ta tackling with this book is regret. Um, I think that's true, but I think you're tackling a lot more than regret with the book. After years of coaching executives, everybody from Alan Mulally to wherever, which I'm going to ask you a question about, Alan, um, you, you've heard all kinds of people give you regrets. Um, and what shift in perspective do people need to embrace to either eliminate or reduce the regrets that they have? Well, if you look at the concept of what leads to a great life, there are, to me, not that many variables. Uh, one that I don't talk about in the book is you need to be healthy. Two, I don't talk about in the book is you need to have like a lower middle class income. Above that, it doesn't go up or down much on happiness. And you need to have great relationships with people you love. Assuming that you're healthy, you got good relationship with people you love, and you got a middle class income, what matters? Well, to me, there's three things that I talk about in the book. First is our aspirations. You need some sort of higher purpose. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why are you on this call? There, there needs to be some higher purpose. It doesn't have to be a religion. It just needs to be some answer to the question, why am I doing this? Two, then you need achievement, your ambition. And your ambitions are these achievements that have a time perspective that hopefully are connected to this aspiration. And then three, your day-to-day your -day actions. And that's the process of life. And if you do have higher aspirations and what you're doing every day, your level of achievement is connected to those aspirations and you enjoy the process of life, well, you, you just won. You pretty much won the game of life. That's, and there may be more, but I'm unaware of what it is. You pretty much won that game of life. And if you look at the people in history, most of our ancestors, they lived in the action zone. I mean, they were doing day-to-day -day things. Their life was pretty much controlled. They did what was in front of them. They tried to eat. They were just living. Not bad or good. I just was. Some people are lost in their heads. They're living up in the clouds. They have very high-level aspirations, but they don't achieve anything. The people I've coached over the years, 
And the people that inspired this book are achievers. And they face the great challenges of achievers. And we never think about achievers as having challenges. Well, they do. And that's what the book is about. Often is when you get lost in achievement. And one of the most important points in the book is you never, ever place your value as a human being on the results you achieve. Well, it's, I'd say this topic is obviously something we could discuss at length and infinitum because it's such a dynamic topic. But I, I did a, a podcast with April Rennie not that long ago, and she sent out a, a letter that said, you know, people are running from something to something. And I thought that was an interesting perspective because hers was all about thriving in this current time. You know, you wrote this during the pandemic right. uh, and you were still in La Jolla then, right? And so, you know, I always question when you've, it was such an interesting person because you've been with so many people face to face, that question about running from something to something, what would, what would you say? Because they're high achievers. They're running oh. to something. So what are they, what most likely, or in your estimation, are they running from? Well, in the COVID period, we had 50 or so people every weekend. My friend Mark Thompson and I spent six hours. So we spent a total of 500 hours and they would rotate the group. So they're a different group every weekend with these 50 people. And it was amazing because, you know, these were like, I can tell you who they were, the president of the World Bank and, you know, the head of St. Jude's Hospital and the Pal Gasol, the basketball player, and Curtis Martin, the football star, and Telly Leung, the Broadway star, and head of the Olympics, and rock, on and on and on. I mean, these are like great achievers. One thing, though, is it's very lonely. There's an old saying, you mentioned what are you running from. It's lonely at the top. It used to be lonely at the top. Today, it is much lonelier at the top. It's lonelier than it's ever been. People don't have a sense of community. They don't have a support group. They don't have anyone to talk to. Yeah. One guy said in our group, one hour a week, I get to act like a human. And that's you know, the hour I, that he had with you guys. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. it. Yeah. You get to be yeah. human. You get to get up and act like a human being. You don't have to put on a show for an hour. I love it. I love it. Now, you, you state that your premise is that our lives toggle back and forth between two emotional polarities. And on one end of the polarity of fulfillment, on the other end, you have regret. And then you've got a line that goes back and forth. Uh, um, can you speak with us about the six fulfillers? Because I think the biggest one is happiness. Uh, in my personal humble opinion after having done 900 podcasts with people with personal growth i would say happiness is probably the biggest one and that we can seek to embrace in our lives the fleeting fulfiller of happiness because in the end you know nobody's going to say to me or you i wish i spent another hour at the corporate office Right. Uh, I love the Dalai Lama's comment, and I say this on many of these shows because his quote hangs on the wall. You're going to be known by who you loved, how many people loved you, and how much you let go. And the reality is that's so true because you talk about in this book too, and I, I'll go there in a, in a few minutes, um, this impermanence and non-attachment. Um, sometimes for CEOs, that's a really difficult one, difficult one to get. So can you speak about those six fulfillers and how we can find that big fleeting one, which is happiness? Let me start with the happiness, then I'll go to the others and just remind me to go to the others. Okay. Uh, if you look at happiness, basically the great Western disease is I will be happy when, when I get the money status, BMW, when I get the condom and when I have this achievement, I will be happy when, well, that's the great Western disease. The great Western myth is once I do this, you know, what the book, what the book say, once you get this, they lived happily ever after. The type, that book is called a fairy tale. There's a reason it's called a fairy tale. That's not life. In life, we are constantly reinventing ourselves. We're constantly starting over. We're constantly re-earning our life. And, and the essence of Buddhism, as I practice it, and there are many schools, schools of Buddhism, I don't make any judgment on someone else's school, Yeah, is basically this. Buddha was brought up very rich, and his father thought, you're going to be fine if you get more. 
And he kept giving him more. He protected him. He lived in a bubble. He was able to sneak out three times. What did he learn? You get old, you get sick, and you die. Shit happens. Mm-hmm. You can have all the money in the world, old, sick, and die. Be poor, old, sick, and die. He said, this more stuff's not doing it. He tried to be happy with less. He starved himself. He lived like a hermit. You know what he learned? Didn't work either. What did Buddha finally realize? You can never be happy with more. You can never be happy with less. There's only one thing in life you can ever be happy with, what you have. It's only one time you can ever be happy now. Only one place you can ever be happy. That would be here. Where's Nirvana? It's listening to a podcast right now with you and me. This is it. It's not someplace else. It's not out there someplace. It's it's here. And, well, you know, that's it, good. Thank you for that plug. That's great. But I, what you know I say is to the Four Noble Truths. And if you look at the first one, the, the Buddha always said there's suffering and the end of suffering. There's yeah. only one person that could cause the end of suffering. If that pursuit of something is causing the suffering, right? the only thing that somebody can do to mitigate that right. is to be okay with them, who and they also, are. <laughs> and also, be don't get fixated on outcomes, results. Right, right. Because, the, again, we have been bombarded with the great Western art form, which goes like this. There's a person person is sad so sad they spend money they buy a product and they become happy well how many it's called a commercial have you ever heard that before how many times how many thousands of times hundreds of thousands of times the same message over and over and over the message is happiness is out there right no it isn't it's in here look they took a great study one group of people became quadriplegics and the other group won the lottery three years later there wasn't much difference in happiness yeah. And well, you know, the conundrum for you, I'm thinking is here is a success coach speaking with high achievers about non-attachment and impermanence. Right. <laughs> and and I, I bet they all get it intellectually. Okay. They get it intellectually. But is there any way you can help them turn the dial down so that it becomes much easier to live with that? Because that isn't a concept. It's a concept that's kind of foreign to achievers. Well, it's not kind of foreign. It's exceptionally foreign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's exceptionally foreign to not just achievers. It's exceptionally foreign to people in the West, period. Yes. We have been so conditioned that, you know, happiness is a function of getting something. Yeah. Let me give you an example of a guy in our group, Safi Bacall. Now, Safi's got an IQ equal to mine and yours combined, probably. And he has PhD physics from Stanford. He wrote a book called Loon Shots. He... Uh, He's made tens of millions of dollars. He started he was, businesses. He was on my podcast. You've met Safi. Consulted <laughs> yeah, yeah. the presidents, you know, yeah, on and yeah. on and on and on. Safi <laughs> said he had a great realization in our groups. He used to think that happiness was a dependent variable based on achievement. He said, I finally realized you can achieve a lot and be happy. You can achieve nothing and be happy. You can achieve a lot and be miserable, and you can achieve nothing and be miserable. Happiness is an independent variable from achievement. This was such a great breakthrough for him as he kept thinking once he achieved something else, he was going to be happier. I told him, Safi, how much you got to achieve here before you declare victory? Let's see. You already got a PhD in physics from Stanford. You need to get two. You already worth tens of millions. You think hundreds of millions are making a difference. You've already successfully started four companies. Think you get happy after five. And you've already consulted with a few presidents. What, a few more going to matter? <laughs> You're already at 99.99 on achievement. You, really you know, think- Marshall, I like what Dr. Sikamar Rao says about happiness. He's a guy at Columbia that talks about Oh, happiness. I know him. He's one of my hundred coaches. Okay. So he says, you got to start with happening. It isn't something you get. Right. You have to just have it. In other words, right. it isn't something so much you pursue. You have to imbibe it. In other words, it's, it's part of Marshall. You see it, you know, uh, life is good. Like, right. you know, that you end that because that's a mantra for you. You know, Marshall Smith's mantra, life is good. Now, Marshall, there's this TEDx talk, Catherine Schultz, she did in 2011 about regret. She said that regret is the emotion we experience when we think that our present situation could be better or happier, underline, and if we had done something different in the past. You right. go on to state that regret is totally in our control. Can you speak to the list, speak with us about the advice you gave? And the reason I picked out Alan, Alan Malala here is because I was in an event in San Diego and I met Alan. I, I wasn't certainly his coach. The, the loveliest man I'd ever met in my life, the most tremendous speaker. 
I'd ever heard at this event in um, at the convention center in San Diego. But he had regrets about leaving Boeing and taking the position of CEO of Ford. Um, how did you coach him through those regrets? I mean, this book is well, the earned life. Know, actually, Alan doesn't have a lot of regrets as a person. And I think one reason he doesn't have regrets is he thinks, if I didn't do something, might I regret it? And then he does it. So I think he's a person actually with very low levels of regret in life. And of all the people I've coached, I mean, I've learned so much from him. Well, one thing, I'm, by the way, a little bit of a diversion. One thing I'm proud of in my book, if you look at the endorsements, is the first paragraph. The first paragraph in the endorsement section is me talking about how great they were, not how yeah, great yeah. I am. Right. And how much I've learned from my wonderful clients and you know how lucky I am to be able to work with people like Alan who's just a wonderful human being. And, and I'd say, you know, Alan is a great case study. He does three things at the same time. One, I'm working on a new book with him right now. So one oh. thing he does is he has a higher purpose in life. He's not doing this for money. He's got plenty of money and status. He doesn't need that. And he's still working at achieving things. He's working at a book and refining what he does. And he's happy. I'll tell you, his day-to-day -day happiness score would be very, very high. I've known him I've known him for 25 years. I've not seen him be unhappy in 25 years. So this guy is a really great role model for everything I teach. And that's the you know simultaneous pursuit of these things, which you can do. One other one about regret though is this. One of the parts of the book I really like is every, the every breath paradigm. Yeah. Every time I take a breath, it's a new me. Buddhist concept of impermanence. Every time I take a breath, it's a new me. Well, I tell people to do this. Everybody listening right now, Take a deep breath. Take a deeper breath. Now, every time I take a breath, it's a new me. So think, new me. Everything that happened before the second in your life was done by an infinite set of people called the previous me's. Now think of all the gifts those previous you's have given the you that's here now. Think about the people they've helped. Think about how hard they tried. Well, if any group of people did that many nice things, what should you say to those nice people? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, did they make a little mistake or two? Let it go. Yeah. Let it yeah. go. Let it go. And don't sit there and criticize the previous versions of your or yourself for being who they are. Uh, you know, LinkedIn, one of my most popular LinkedIn quotes is this. Forgive other people for being who they are and forgive yourself for expecting that they'd be somebody else. Well, we can yes, apply yes. that to our own life. Forgive the previous versions of you for being who they were and forgiving yourself for regretting that they weren't someone else. Well, self-forgiveness self self is a big one here. Yeah. Little sign on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably backwards, but it's on my desk all day long. I'll show you something else in a minute as well. So you state the official policy on regret in the pages of this book is to accept uh, the inevitable, but reduce it, reduce its frequency, right? right? Which means we need to create a life of fulfillment. We, you know, we talked about happiness. Oh, the six, the six. We didn't, we didn't get all of the six. So maybe what? we should go back and you can give me the other five. <laughs> all right. Well, the first one is, you need to be having a purpose. On, I'm going to do micro and macro. At the macro level, you need a purpose. And on a day-to-day -day level, you need to be setting goals or objectives aligned with that purpose. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is you need to be making progress toward achieving things related to that purpose. Then you need to find meaning. Every day, you need to find meaning in life. And by the way, finding meaning doesn't mean you have a meaningful job. It means you create meaning where you are. One of my good friends is Gary Ridge, who is CEO of WD-40. They had some of the highest scores on meaning in the entire world of any corporation, higher than children's hospitals. Now, you can't say making lubricants is more important than curing sick children, yet they, they found meaning. They created meaning every day. The next one is be happy, you know, being happy. And then they, in other words, are building positive relationships with people. And then the final one is being fully engaged, being fully engaged in what you do. And if you, that's about it. Now, one thing I always teach is a daily question process. Every day, yeah. if you just give yourself a test on, and, and the questions I'll start with a phrase, my daughter Kelly taught me this. I'm proud of my daughter. She had a PhD from Yale and she's a full professor at Vanderbilt now. That's why I live in Nashville. 
Kelly taught me this. Ask questions that begin with, did I do my best too? Why? You can't blame someone else. Mm -hmm. You see, if you ask, were you happy? And someone says, no, you know why? It's their fault. If you ask, did I do my best to be happy? Given the situation, did I do my best to find happiness? Did I do my best to create meaning? Did I do my best to ask those six questions every day? Just by asking those questions, our research is amazing. You know, 30, 30 something, 34% of people got better at everything. Two thirds got better at four things. 91% got better at something and almost nobody gets worse. Why? Every day, these questions get us to focus on the one thing in life that we can control. Did I do my best? And by the way, yeah. it doesn't say you were happy. Did you even try? Did you even think about being happy? Yeah, in my book, Triggers, yeah, I, I talk about interviewing five, uh, three medical doctors, three of the smartest people I ever met, Dr. Jim Kim, simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology in five years, became president of Dartmouth College, head of Partners in Health, and then president of the World Bank. Dr. Ra Shah, who is uh, head of the USAID and is now head of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Dr. John Noseworthy, who's the CEO of the Mayo Clinic. So, you know, when the brains were first out, passed out, none of these guys are near the back of the line. All three individually ask a question. How would you score on the average day? Did I do my best to be happy? All three had the same answer. Never dawned on me to try to be happy. Never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Too busy achieving things. So I ask them, did it dawn on you or you're going to die? Did they cover that in medical school? Death. <laughs> did they cover that topic? He said, yeah, they, they brought up that death thing. And I said, do you think this is a silly question or a trivial question? I said, no, it is a very important question I forgot to ask. It's a very important question. I just forgot to ask. Well, ask yourself the question today. Am I doing my best to be happy today? Am I making the best of it? And by the way, what, I'm, I'm a great believer in the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is pretty clear. It talks about somebody has a choice, bad and worse. Sometimes you got a choice in life, bad and worse. Pick bad, make the best of it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you got a choice between bad and worse. Take bad, make the best of it. You're not going to do any better. You're not going to turn bad to good. Just make the best of the bad. Well, that whole concept around, uh, you know, look, we're 100% responsibility for, we take 100%, or well, we should take 100% responsibility for how we feel, our emotions, our actions, everything. And once you get that, that you realize that um, when, the other thing is around your beliefs and the attachments and the, and what you were talking about in permanence, because finitude, um, I know so well, just this last uh, two years, I lost two brothers, not to COVID, but you know, you were asking those doctors something, Hey, in medical school, did you guys actually, you know, think about this? Never dawned on us to be happy. Well, you should be, be happy when you go work that way. Now, you tell three great stories in the introduction, and I thought it was great because one of your guys was named Leonard. That's my legal name, first name, Leonard. And Leonard was the only one who got it right, actually. <laughs> um, and you tell the stories about three people that you coached, and Leonard was able to succeed at accepting what was and eliminate his regrets. What advice would you give to our listeners about non-attachment and eliminating, beating themselves up, over their regrets? Well, the first thing is forgive yourself. Yeah. And then what happens is we feel bad. Then we feel bad about feeling bad. Then we feel bad about feeling bad about feeling bad. Well, you don't have to do that. And whatever you did in the past, you did. Just right. let it go. You know, and you, the, here's why Buddhism is so hard to understand for people in the West. The essence of Buddhism is now. And when I say there's only one second in life you need to learn to be happy, it's now. Mm -hmm. For people, that means that they think it means I have to be happy every second. And I start thinking, well, what if so and so happens? I might not be happy. That totally misses the point. The point is not you have to be happy every second, it's the opposite of that point. It's right. only one right. second you need to be happy now. Right. Just focus on now. If you're going to sit there and worry about something that might happen or not, might not happen in five years, you're going to get bummed out by that. Well, all right, you're not going to be happy. Well, you're not living now. You're, you're living in a dream. So really, I think important to focus on now, now, now. I mean, and well, and I, and I concur with you. And I, and I remember uh, Jim Laura was back on the show again, not that long ago. 
his book was Power of Full Engagement, if you remember. Yes, yes. And, and it was around energy management. And the reason right. I'm mentioning this is because so much of our energy is spent. You know, I, I this is going to sound like a broken record here. But the imagined future and the dead past, right? You know, the reality is, you know, when I do meditation retreats in the Orcas Islands, they have these monks that come, and they say, "Well, what do you?" You know, one of my friends says, "Well, what do you guys want?" Because they had no watches, they said, "Well, we'd actually like to have a watch," and they said, "Well, why would you want a watch?" And they put a skull and crossbones at the top of the bed, and they wanted a watch, right? I thought this is a great story, and they said, "Well." Because we're trying to figure out, or what we would like to know is how much time we have left, right? Not what time it is. <laughs> so interesting. Now, the operative definition of the earned life is we are living an earned life when the choices, risks, and efforts we make in each moment, each moment, align with an overarching purpose in our lives, which you just said. Um, regardless of the eventual outcome, outcomes, right? right? You state that something truly earned makes three simple requirements of us. Can you speak with the listeners about the three simple requirements of the earned life? What are they? I don't know. <laughs> 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 Maybe you don't, don't, don't remember. I don't know. I took it out of the book. So... <laughs> <laughs> I cover so many things. You got to realize that. I, I, it's a, it's I okay. don't remember the three requirements and six this or that. So it's what we'll tell our listeners is Marshall doesn't know. So go buy the book. How's that? Yeah, and by the, the way, yeah. when you buy the remember. book, when you buy the book, you have this free course. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I want to mention that. Maybe this is a great time to mention it. He's sure. got a full send, on. Send me an email. Yes. So when you buy the book, you send him an email and he's going to give you this free online course that you've got, right? Yes. And I would encourage everybody to go to marshallgoldsmith.com and we'll just skip that question because it doesn't really matter. But the reality is the answer is in the book. So if you want, if you want the answer, you got to go in the book. And the reason is I didn't write down the, the three uh, statements. Marshall, our sense of fulfillment and happiness simply doesn't last that we've er that the earned life is imperative and a fragile vessel to contain our wishes and desires for right. an earned life. Speak with the listeners about the influence that the philosophy of Buddhism has had on your perspective about attachment and impermanence in life. Because you started studying it when you were 18, you put a little cliff note in the bottom of the book. I don't think in any of your other books, of course I could be wrong, where you actually disclosed that, okay? Right. But this time at age, what's your age now? Uh, 73. 73, so you and I are five years apart. Yeah. You, you start to let people see in the window a little bit more and see where your philosophy is coming from. And right. I thought that was really, really nice of you oh. um, because I didn't know that about you. But when I read it, I assumed that that was where you're coming from. So tell our listeners, if you would, what what's up there with the impermanence and the attachment. Well, as a coach, I use Buddhism all the time. Let me tell you a few ways. One is feed forward. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Just don't do it. That is so freeing. So in my program with these 50 great people every weekend, they would practice feed forward over and over. Each person says, here's what I feel good about. Here's what I want to do better. They say, give me ideas for the future, not feedback about the past. Everyone gives them ideas for the future and they say, thank you. Then another person, another person, another person, another person. People love this because it's positive, it's upbeat, it's helpful, and nobody's getting judged. Nobody, they're, they're accountable, but they're not judged. Nobody's being judged by anything. So that's one element of Buddhism I use. Uh, another element of, of Buddhism I use, it's really central, is that we're constantly reinventing ourselves. So I'll coach people, they'll say things like this. Oh, I'm a bad listener. I can't listen. I've never been able to listen. I can't listen. So I look in their ears. Say, well, you got something stuck in there? Why can't you listen? Well, we talk about ourselves as we, if we have incurable genetic defects that will last permanently throughout our lives. As opposed to saying, you know, in the past, I haven't listened very much. But in the future, I can listen. 
I'm, I'm not stuck with this. And it's a very important point. If you don't do this, let's say your self-image is I'm a bad listener and I'm your coach. And let's say you work very hard and people say you're a good listener. If you don't work on the way you define yourself as a human being, you know how you're going to feel on the inside? You feel like a phony. You know what you're going to say? That's not the real me. That's not the real me. You see, the real me is a bad listener. That's the real me. I just acted like a good listener, but that's not real. You have this weird idea of this real me that goes through life never changing, as opposed to saying, look, the me that's here today is not the same that was 10 years ago or five years ago or last week. One story in the book that people love is the story of the guy and he's with his wife and they had a great, you know, great weekend with the kids and they're driving back home. And the wife starts in on, well, 10 years ago, you didn't do this and this, and you could have done this and we could have had this and that. And you know what he said? You're right. I'm not the same person as I was 10 years ago. I really think I'm a better person than I was 10 years ago. And, you know, that person 10 years ago made some mistakes. I'm not that person. And his yeah, wife we, said, you're right. His wife said, you're right. You're right. You're not that person. You're a better person. Why am I bringing up what some guy did 10 years ago? That guy's not in this car right now. Mm -hmm. That guy's not in this car. You're not that guy. You're a different person. And I think that's a great way to look at life is, you know, we're not who we were 10 years ago or five years ago or one hour ago. We're a different person. And that's it. We're constantly evolving in life. Well, what a great introspection, because awareness is the only thing that creates that. So her question actually allowed a t an opportunity for a dialogue that then yeah. allowed the two of them to kind of come together to have this realization and that awareness. We don't ever know who's going to give us that awareness or going to pop the question. Um, right. One thing that I've become good at is asking question after having done 900 and something of these podcasts. Um, now you've sp you spoke by, by the way, that, that's an interesting uh, element of the book. It says the lost art of asking. Right. I did see that in there. Yeah. Hey, I've got, I got an exercise for everybody. Are you ready? Yes. This, I have a fun exercise for everybody. All right. I asked in my classes, I always said, do you think customer satisfaction is important? Yes. Should we ask our customers for input? Yes. Should we listen to our customers? Yes. Do you have a husband, wife, or partner at home? Yes. Have you been asking that person, what can I do to be a better partner? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have people take out, everybody is listening, take out your cell phone and send a text message to your husband, wife, or partner and ask one question. What can I do to be a better partner? Yeah. That's a great exercise. It's and and you know what? Half of them would fall off their chair because they're wondering where was this person today who came oh, up I get, with this. I get hilarious <laughs> things. Let me tell you some of my favorite responses. One is who, who has stolen my husband's cell phone? Uh, are you drunk? Uh, you know, uh, is this message intended for me? Uh, <laughs> Who have you been sleeping with? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I can imagine that you get all of those and more. Well, it, it's 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 fascinating, and the book is wonderful because it gives an opportunity to people to deep dive in introspection and look at regret and look at fulfillment in their life and look at the continuum and look at ways to do that. And you know, you speak with the listeners, if you would. We you you mentioned it, the Great Western Disease of what Buddha called the hungry ghost. I don't think a lot of people have heard the term the hungry ghost. So more importantly, please give the listeners your advice on how to avoid getting sucked into the Maya of life and living the illusion. Because the reality here is if we're gonna go with Buddhism, we might as well go a little bit deeper even here now because this this maya this thing that sucks people in to the fact that they believe that what it is i know many of my listeners know the term some yes. people listening may not right but could you could you give them some advice about how to avoid that how to avoid that trap because you said a minute ago you go buy a new car you get the tesla you buy the house on the hill you buy the blah 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 blah, blah, blah. you went down a whole list of things yeah. And you're going to be happy, right? Well, no. that's the Maya that I'm talking about here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And to me, the key is, as you journey through life, you just ask yourself, look, 
am I doing my best? Is this something that's related to my long-term ambition in life? And then you ask yourself, you know, am I enjoying this ride? Am I enjoying what I'm doing right now? If the answer is yes, that's it. Now, the results are going to be what they're going to be. You don't have total control over the results of much of anything. You could get run over by a car tomorrow. You didn't control COVID. You know, the results are going to be what they're going to be. I'm not saying you don't try to achieve things, yet you don't place your value as a human being based on achievement. It is a fool's game. It is a fool's game. If you saw the bios of the 50 people I spent COVID period with every weekend, you'd think these people, if achievement would make you happy, they'd all be dancing off the ceiling every day. They are all in 99.99 in terms of achievement, right? Well, it's not bad to achieve. On the other hand, you achieve to achieve. You don't achieve to be happy. You don't achieve to find peace. Finding peace to find peace. As Sri Kumar said, be happy to be happy. But don't believe that I'm going to achieve something that's going to make me happy because it never ends. The hungry ghost. The hungry ghost is you're always eating, but you're never full. Well, whatever you achieve, what is, what's the next thing? Next year. Next year. Albert Berla, Pfizer. How was your year? Hey, well, came up with a vaccine. Good. Employee engagement high. Good. Book. Good. CEO of the year. Good. Good, good, good. What's your problem? Next year. <laughs> Do you think anybody that bought that stock cares that he came up with a vaccine? No. Do you think they care how, how what he did last year? Zero. Next year. There's always going to be next year. And look at this. Michael Phelps, 25 gold medals. What's he think about doing? Killing himself. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. He's been on that uh, uh, advocating that application for mental health, which I, I think yeah. is very cool. So, so that being the case, you know, look, um, if not, if, if that is the case, that is the case. Uh, we know that you're so, calling that the great Western disease. And I, I concur. That is it. Um, getting there and then being able to sustain this level of happiness, you're saying there's a continuum. It goes mm. back and forth, be able to live with that, be able to accept it. Some, And I think the key is, uh, and I might be wrong here, but I obviously think I'm on the right track. It's around accepting where you are and just right. saying, that's okay. I am where I am. I know? am where I am. Right. I am where I am. And, you know, I mean, uh, my my last podcast was with my friend Dave Chang, who's just a great guy. And his co colleague, Chris, said, well, yeah. I said, what about our typical listeners? They're not like you. I said, well, just describe one. Uh, 27 years old, a tech guy, Berkeley, uh, striving to get ahead, looking at you, thinking easy for that guy to talk. You know, he's rich. He's written famous books. He works with great people, blah, blah, blah. Easy for you to say. I said, you know what? That kid has something I don't have, 45 years. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have 45 years. Nope. You, want some, you want some best selling books? Okay, give me 45 years. We got a deal. You know, it's just fine. You can have a damn book. It's all right. Well, you don't look at life and say, I wish I was him. Yeah, you really want to be 73? Maybe not. I mean, I'm happy being me, but I don't think if I were 27, I'd want to be 73. Be happy being 27. Most definitely. Now, the every Beth paradigm connect to living and earned life. You say, I say, how does the every Beth paradigm connect to the living and end life? You say the connection is immediate and direct as flipping a switch uh, to fill a dark room with light. And where um, there's darkness, the light serves the darkness. Right. If we accept that everything of value that we have earned is impermanent, subject to the whims and, in, and indifferences of the world, which you just mentioned, we must also accept the prized possessions needed to consequently re-earn uh, practically on a daily and hourly basis, perhaps as frequently as every breath. That's right. Can you explain what you mean? I think you have, but you know what? There's something about repeating things three times. <laughs> and you understand this as being a great public speaker. <laughs> If you know you repeat something three times and sometimes people get it, right? So well, I, I'm asking a question. Is Buddhism about reincarnation? To me, Buddhism is about nothing but reincarnation. 
everything is reincarnation. Right. Every breath is reincarnation. Every breath is a new me. Every breath is a new me. And we get a new start. We get a chance to start over. And we get a chance to be something different. And we get that, we get that chance. And I, I think the key is when you look at life that way, it makes life a lot different. It's a very non-Western thing. And let me give you an example. Some people say, does that mean you don't care about achievement? No, I didn't say that. Let's take the example of, I didn't, I didn't tell you the story of the golfer and the beer can, did I? Nope, not okay, that one. The golfer and the beer can. So there's a guy in the country club and he's got a chance to win his little club championship. He's teeing off on the 18th. In front of him, there's some drunk people drinking, making noise, very annoying. And he breathes, concentrate. It's a perfect drive. The perfect drive looks good, but then all of a sudden it hits something and goes into the rough, terrible line. He walks toward the ball and what does he see? A beer can. The idiots in front of him have left a beer can. He's very angry. How could they have done this? What does a golfer need to do? Stop and breathe. Stop and breathe. Forget about those people. Forget about the drive. Forget about the results. Forget about winning the club championship. Come up with a strategy of what you want to do. You walk to the ball and you hit the shot in front of you. The other thing about the golfer is enjoy the process. You're in some little country club. You're not a pro golfer. Enjoy. What are you there for? You're not going to be Arnold Palmer. Have a good time. Have a good time. Hit the shot. Make peace and move on. Well, Makes sense. You don't necessarily hit a worse shot. You probably hit a better shot because you're not focused on the past, which you can't change. You're not focused on the future, which may or may not happen. You're actually just focused on one thing. Just hit the shot. You know, yep. Coach K, the coach at Duke, is a good thing. He watches a player miss a shot and they act sad or just sad or angry. What does he say? Next play. Next play. He watches a player make a great shot and he's jumping up and cheer cheering. You know what he says? Next play. You got to well, let go. You got to let go of the past. I think life, uh, as you know, and we get to be the age we are, it's all about the next play. That's and it. all and all you can do is pay homage and respect to all the plays prior to this play, right. meaning this play in this moment, this podcast in this moment. Um, hey, look, I did nine hundred and something before this one. This is nine hundred and something. This is like this is great. I it couldn't be any better. And I think that's the way you have to look at it. And that way, what happens is happiness just happens uh, right. because you're doing that. So you created a two-letter exercise for people that intellectually understood the Everett Beth paradigm, mm -hmm. but haven't developed the muscle memory that makes it natural and instinctive in their lives. And I, that's an important point. Can you explain the two-letter exercise and what our listeners can expect to experience if they engage in that exercise and it's, it's yes, it's, I can actually remember that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the exercise, two letters. One letter is you write a letter to a previous version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you write a letter and you say, thank you to this previous version of you. Thank you for uh, learning to speak Chinese or thank you for studying Buddhism or whatever it happens to be. You think my life today is better because of this thing you did back then. And you're like you said, pay homage, a good phrase. You're paying homage to that person. You're saying, thank you, previous me. Thank you for doing that for me. And then the second exercise, you write a letter to the future you. And you say to the future you, you know, I'm going to make some investments right now. I'm investing in you. And here's what I hope happens as a result of my investments. So you're really giving the future you some ideas of, Here's what I'm doing now for you. And here's what I hope works for you. And here's what I'd like to see you do. I, I think it's a great exercise. The negative example I used is the CEO who basically said, I worked 80 hours a week for 40 years with one goal. So my kids would never have to work as hard as I did. Then he said, the worst thing I could have ever done for my children, for myself, for my family, and for life. Kids are spoiled. They have no work ethic. They don't like me. I don't know my wife, bad use of 40 years. A long time, but don't have regret. <laughs> Dude, if, if that's where his head is at, and I get that that's very, very powerful. But what's powerful is the awareness not to have the regret about 
what it was you did. Right. You know, you, so you spent 40 years doing it. You did it. But that doesn't mean that's the way you have to be going forward. Change. And by the way, <laughs> those, those previous years gave you a lot of money. Yeah. They gave you some neat stuff. Yeah. How can you take what they gave you and make the best of it? Right. Right. You know, you, you have done, you said you spent eight days a year teaching leadership course at Goldman Sachs executives yeah. and their top clients. You work with Mark Trerick, I think it is. How do you say it? T-E-R. Tercy. Tercy. At Goldman. Can you tell his great story about creating his own life and what was stopping him from claiming his new career in life? Because this one was actually a shift in careers. Total um, shift. Yeah. yeah. So Mark is just a great friend of mine, just a wonderful guy, and was mega successful at Goldman Sachs. He was, I think, one of the top five people in the company when they did the IPO. Now, if you know what that means, that means you don't ever have to work again. He's right. got more money he's going to spend in many lifetimes. So then Mark gets this opportunity to be the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, which he really would love. But he's thinking, well, what will they think of me? And I told him, which he has talked about changed his life, I said, live your own life. Who are they? Don't live some other person's version of your life. It's your life. And don't sit there and say, what would they think of me? Well, number one, they don't care. You think they're going to hold it against you because you're the CEO of the Nature Conservancy? No, you leave Goldman Sachs, you create a little more space. Somebody takes your customers and move into your office. They're probably all happy to see you going anyway. They don't care don't care and you're out doing good deeds god bless you you don't have to apologize for that well you know live your own life <laughs> it was great because they a good point why don't i just live my own life very good it was a great story in the book by the way um well look in wrapping the interview up and then i'm going to show you something okay. um the earned life it has so much practical advice and guidance for individuals wanting to live a fulfilled life without regrets what Three takeaways, either something we've already talked about or something that we haven't talked about, would you leave the listeners with as we kind of wrap up this podcast? I'd say I would take away, one takeaway is have a higher aspiration. Have an answer to the question, why? Why am I doing this? Why? And then number two, focus on your ambitions or achievement. So you're doing something about that aspiration. It's not just a pipe dream. You're actually achieving something that's helping you get there. And three, enjoy the process. And in my life, my higher aspiration is I just want to help as many people as I can in the limited time I have left to do it and hopefully help them now and then after I'm no longer with us. That's the higher aspiration. It doesn't have a target. My, my immediate achievement is being on this with you. Well, but you're going to reincarnate, Marshall, and then you're going to come back smarter more handsome and then you're going to write more books. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> smarter maybe but more handsome that's got to be a stretch <laughs> oh. Oh, and, then, and then the final thing you just you know have a good time life is short you know my my new research it's not published yet indicates we're all going to be equally dead here so i think yeah i i think it's a pretty safe bet so you know just enjoy this process of life and we're all going to die anyway. Just enjoy the process of life. And so that's about it. And then, and again, no one can define meaning for you, but you. I can't tell you what's going to be meaningful for you. And I can't tell you what's going to make you happy. Those answers said, look in here. Whatever that is for you, do that. Whatever that is for you, you just do that. And, and as the Mark Tersig story should point, no one else can tell you that. Well, Marshall... Another wonderful book. I should state that, you know, I know Mark Ritter is the co-author, has oh, been on, on many of your books. Oh, so one. on huh, four of them, right? Yeah. Four. And I want to give him recognition because, you know, behind the scenes, these books don't get written by themselves. I'm working on one right now with a, um, a mountain climber who's climbed all the highest seven summits in Everest twice. And I've interviewed all these guys who've gone up and just climb, you, you name it, every mountain climber. And it's it's very interesting, the correlation that we've talked about here. And, you know, this, this, this whole concept, and I'm just saying to write a good book, it is a huge project. And Marshall, I just want to commend Mark and you, 
namaste to both of you yeah. for such wonderful work because it's articulated so well and so well put together, easy to follow, a uh, great book to read, and something that really gets people to think deep about their life, how they're living their life, and how they can better their life. And you've always done that with every book, but this one in particular, I think adds more mm, oomph. So thank you, thank you for doing that. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for inviting me very much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Namaste.